User experience is one of the most important aspects of business today. It's very difficult. It's very, very misunderstood. And right now on CXO Talk, we are speaking with one of the world's experts on this topic. I'm Michael Krigsman. I'm an industry analyst and the host of CXO Talk. Before we go on, I want to say a huge thank you to IPSoft. We are in their AI Experience Lab in New York City, and I'm so grateful to IPSoft for making CXO Talk possible. Now, I want you to tell your friends, tell your family, tell everybody you know to watch this episode and be sure to subscribe on YouTube. I'm so very thrilled to welcome Scott Belsky, who is the Executive Vice President and Chief Product Officer at Adobe. Hey, Scott, how are you? Great, thanks for having me. You know, I have to tell you, we here at CXO Talk, we create videos and we live in your products. <laughs> so thanks a lot. Thanks for making uh, them. Thank you, and uh, we're always making them better. So good stuff to come. So Scott, uh, tell us about Adobe. Sure, so uh, most folks probably know that um, Adobe has been at the forefront of creative tools for a few decades now. Um, Many people know Premiere Pro in the video space, Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, uh, and there's all another part of our business that's all about digital transformation for companies on the marketing side as well. And so if you think about it, you have, um, you have people who are marketers, you know, trying to work with creatives. You have creatives who are trying to work with marketers. We also have a business called Document Cloud, the PDF, uh, which is quite a global format at this point. And, and all these things come together really around an epicenter uh, of creativity. And uh, it's, it's fun. Um, in some ways, we have um, some products that really have great legacies that we always want to protect. We also always want to modernize them and welcome in new types of customers and make our products more accessible while making them more powerful, which bring um, all sorts of challenges on the customer experience side uh, for us to tackle. Good. Well, we're, de we're definitely going to speak about that. So you were EVP and Chief Product Officer. And Mouthful. <laughs> it is, and and so what do you do? What do you, what do you actually do there? <laughs> yeah, sure. So you know, a little bit, uh, just from a history perspective, Adobe acquired my business, um, Behance, in uh, late 2012, and so and Behance is sort of like think of it as a LinkedIn for the creative professional community. It's over 15 million creatives sharing their work online from all different verticals, motion graphics, fashion, um, all sorts, all of the all of the designs you can think of, architecture, illustration, and and um, and and folks are sharing their work to uh, to build their own following to get opportunities and when Adobe transitioned from software to services and launched Creative Cloud as a new way of getting products that didn't update every 18 months uh, if you bought it but actually updated every month hopefully um, they realized that a community needed to be at the center uh, of, 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 the, of the offering and so that's when uh, Behance became part of Adobe and, uh, and then coming in and not only leading Behance, but also our mobile efforts and some building some of the Creative Cloud services, taking over our fonts service that streams fonts into all of our products. You know, that's been a, quite a journey. And, uh, and then more recently, have had the opportunity to serve in this new role, Chief Product Officer, which really just oversees the, um, the, the customer experience of our products, the um, development of our products into new mediums, like voice, augmented reality, um, how you publish just specific social platforms where we consume a lot of the content these days that fills our lives, and, uh, and thinking about how, uh, how the digital marketing and creative experience all come together. So it's a very forward-looking role in that sense. It is, it is, and, and um, you know, I think that uh, there, the, the two parts of my job that get me most excited, one is that really forward thinking, what are the future mediums? And how are we gonna help people, just like we had to help the creative world go from print to, uh, to web, and then web to mobile, now what's next? Is it, is, it, is it augmented reality? Is it voice interfaces? So that's one part that's really exciting. But I'll tell you, the other part of the job that's interesting is making a product simpler, making it more accessible to more people. I mean, you think about a product like Photoshop, it is, um, sometimes it looks like a cockpit when you open the product for the first time. How do we help people navigate and have a, both a basic and an advanced experience in a product as powerful as Photoshop? So is that really a crucial or core element of user experience simplification? It is. I, I, uh, simplification in a few different ways. Um, you know, one, one concept around simplification is, of course, um, the onboarding, the first mile experience. Um, one part of it is what I like to call progressive disclosure. 
So you don't show everyone every option at once. You progressively disclose the functionality of a product as the customer is ready for it, which leads to a lot of challenges around personalization, how to use artificial intelligence to make the product know what the customer, who the customer is and when they're ready for what. And then there's another concept um, I like to call graceful failure. So when you're in a product and you're just stumped and you just don't know what to do next, or you opened up Photoshop because you wanted to edit a photo and you realize, whoa, this is not the right product for me, how do we actually gracefully fail you into the right product for you? Because we have a lot of products in our arsenal at Adobe. We also have a whole suite of products called Spark that are all about just you know, K through 12 students use them, as well as social marketing teams that have no design background. And we have to kind of make sure customers find their right product. You just wrote a book called The Messy Middle. What is The Messy Middle? Yeah, so, um, and it's kind of meta because I, uh, the, when you write a book, first of all, it is a very arduous process and, and you go through tons of ups and downs where you feel like it's never gonna happen and then you get super excited and then you feel like it's never gonna happen and then you get super excited. It's the same thing goes when you're building products. The same thing goes when you're transforming a company or a team. You have this extraordinarily volatile journey. And I think the myth is that you have this incredible idea or something you want to change within the company or your product or whatever it is. And then you realize how hard it is. And then you have this progressively linear way towards a finish line that is momentous. Um, when in fact, I think the best case scenario is you have extraordinarily volatile uh, experiences getting to that finish line. But net net, you have a positive slope. In essence, every low is a little less low than the one before it, and every high is a little higher. And so I went through that in writing this book. I feel like I'm going through that with every one of my product teams as we transform the product and modernize it for the future. I also think as I change the product organization and our culture and how we think about end-to-end -end experiences, and, and this is not just specific to Adobe, I believe every company kind of goes through their own messy middle. Um, it's, uh, it's something we have to talk about, and it really boils down to two things. It's how do you endure that volatility? How do you keep the team engaged and rewarded and even though there's no end in sight sometimes? And how do you optimize everything that's working, whether it's in the product or how your team is working together or how you're managing? Why do we need to talk about this? Why, why, what are the misconceptions about this middle project stage before, after the beginning and before the end? I think there are a lot of misconceptions about the middle. Um, uh, well, and we'll, I'll give you a few examples. Um, on, the, on, the, on the aspect of enduring that volatility and those questions and the self-doubt and the ambiguity and working in anonymity, when no one knows what you're doing yet, um, which is very, very difficult. I think there's this misconception that having a great vision and, um, and knowing where you want to be years from now is actually enough to keep you and your team engaged with the pursuit. When in fact, um, that, that's not true. We are all hardwired with a short-term reward system. How does organizational structure militate against uh, an end-to-end -end customer experience? It's a great question because again, everyone knows they want to have a great customer experience. Everyone's intentions are generally pretty good. Um, and yet you have uh, a lot of different functions in an organization that are ultimately responsible for their deliverable. And so if I am the person who sends transactional emails, for example, and I am the one who says, uh, okay, every time a customer signs up for the product or service, they get this email. Every time they stop coming back for a period of time, they get this email. Every time they do this, they get this email. Those are my deliverables. And it's just human nature and in, in, in a structure where that team is led by someone independently, sometimes is in another division, reports to somebody different, uh, that they start to think about that part of the customer experience in isolation. And, uh, and just like kind of a, a tree, you know, they go in one direction and then another team that's responsible for the in product experience goes in another direction. And the other team that's responsible for marketing and retargeting or whatever you do to engage customers or bring new customers in is going in another direction. And so very, very well-intentioned teams all land in slightly different places. And then from a customer experience perspective, it's like, well, wait a second. They described the product this way here and this way there, and they use different terminology and different UI, and it's slightly off, and the customer is just confused. And, uh, and, and the answer is not necessarily to make all this one team. 
The answer, I think, is to have everyone kind of align with a, 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 a customer journey that's visualized, which is really where design starts to be the ultimate cheat in a good way to get there. So what then is customer experience? What are the components? Yeah, so I think that the um, the end-to-end -end journey, right, of a customer experience, if you think about it, it's, it's discover at the top of the funnel. It's, um, it's try or test or explore. It's buy. So when someone decides to actually engage, commit their time, sign up, pay something, um, and then it's use. Like what's the usage experience like? And then I think there's something at the end also called retain, which is really about how do you retain that customer over time and how do you make sure that it's um, a deeper relationship. Then in some instances where there's businesses with network effects, retain is also about inviting a friend, you know, actually organically growing the product or service. And so if you think about the customer experience in that sense as like a, as like a, a linear journey, you realize that there's actually a whole suite of considerations and tactics under each one of these parts of the journey. And, um, you know, and I think about that a lot, especially from a, uh, someone who crafts product for a living. Um, there's so much that is either you know, uh, underestimated or just woefully ignored that we need to think about. Does this apply to business to business products as well as business to consumer? A hundred percent. And in fact, we uh, at Adobe, we have a very large enterprise business and we think about the customer journey quite similarly. And, uh, and, and it's, it, there, there's really no difference actually. And if, if when it comes down to, uh, the, only, the only real difference is that most of your competitors in a B2B side aren't thinking about this. So to me, it's even more of a competitive advantage. And I think you see this. You see a lot of new modern companies, whether it be a, um, like a Zendesk or you know, a bunch of other companies that actually have um, really thought of, been more thoughtful about the end-to-end -end journey and compete based on that. If a company wants to revamp or, let's say, improve customer experience, is this the way they need to think about it as that, as that journey? I think it's helpful to break down what the journey is. Um, the next step is empathy, is really making sure that your team, your executives, uh, and the folks on the front line are really empathizing with what the customer is suffering from. I think actually one of the greatest mistakes that product leaders make is they become passionate for a solution to a problem rather than seeking more empathy with the people suffering the problem. Another area I talk about in the book, whether it's entrepreneurs or other people leading teams, is that they'll sometimes solve something based on their passion for the solution and then they'll realize, wait, you know, it's not being used, what did I miss? It's oftentimes it was the empathy. And so what does that actually mean? It means going into customer support centers and actually taking some calls. It means spending time shoulder to shoulder with customers, going through and navigating your product, and you're realizing, oh my goodness, like how could they not know? You just click that, you just click that, but you're seeing them suffering, and you're realizing that it's not working. You know, it needs to be better. Uh, and there's really no shortcuts to that. Now, as big companies, ironically, we tend to outsource that stuff, customer research. We just say, hey, we're gonna hire an agency to figure this out for us. When in fact, to me, it's, that's, that's your competitive advantage. How could you have other people do that and become disconnected from the findings? So really, as much as possible, putting people through the motions within your own team is a big, big first step. Scott, how do we avoid the arrogance that comes from success? And this is applicable both to small companies as well as large companies, the arrogance that's, that, that says, We've already made it. It's, it's a great question. And um, another area that, uh, that was a theme you know, in some of the interviews I did for the book was the, uh, the healthy paranoia that you have to feel um, with success. Uh, whereas some of the best product leaders out there would say that they're never fully satisfied with their product. And whatever anyone is, almost like an artist, you can say, oh, you're, you have this, you're such an amazing artist, you're in all these galleries, and yet I'm saying, I hate my work, I want it to be better, I want it to be different. And there's something kind of healthy about that distaste that keeps us going and innovating. And uh, the risk of stock prices and award shows and other kind of accolades is that we start to believe that our stuff can't get any better. So, um, so what are the, what are the um, what are the kind of mental hacks and, 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 and cultural tendencies of an organization that can keep you humble and appropriately paranoid? Fortunately, I think that's getting a little easier these days when you start to see companies 
that transform industries without having any expertise in those industries. You look at a company like Airbnb, you know, and I interviewed uh, Joe, who's one of the co-founders for my book, and he just talks about the fact that he didn't even know what the nomenclature was for the hotel industry going into it. There are all these acronyms that people use, and he like didn't even know them. And he talks about how that was daunting, but actually was an advantage because he didn't feel limited in any way by these traditional metrics that um, ultimately are the reason why Airbnb wasn't invented by Starwood. Uh, and and so you have to you have to start to realize that the incumbent, you know, the the, the startups are thinking differently. You know, they're doing something right in that in, in, instance. Uh, ignorance is in some ways an advantage, and you have to stay appropriately paranoid in order, to, in order to survive. You know, the problem with this is that to stay appropriately paranoid means you have already adopted this attitude of humility, and the people who haven't are not listening to this advice. Uh -huh. so, so what should an employee of, of a company do who recognizes this but doesn't have a strong enough voice to overcome the lack of humility in the organization as a whole or inside the senior leadership. Yep. Well, I think um, I, I, what I've seen work within teams is, uh, is ultimately crafting a narrative of a potential future that creates some fear. Uh, and, it's, um, you know, and it's another sort of way that storytellers and the creative people within an organization can contribute. Because I think what you're saying is it's hard for people to even understand a future other than the one that they're in and or they're, they're logically going towards. And, um, and so it's really about, again, those edges that we talked about. What I see is, is that is pretty effective is taking one of those edges and, um, you know, and saying, wow, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example um, in, our, in our video editing business. Um, we have people all around the world using Premiere Pro, Hollywood, everywhere else, and it's a real market leader. And, um, and yet we see some of these gaming engines uh, that are being used to make video games uh, that do real-time rendering. Uh, they're starting to be used by some people making commercials, saying, hey, instead of taking that car and having to shoot it, and all the all the all the, the 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 labor involved with that, we could just like you know take some scenery and then place the car in there. And if it's unnoticeable, maybe we should explore that. And so that's a fundamental shift. If suddenly you know video is a lot of a lot of video is crafted on what is what are now gaming engines uh, to make video games, and um, and you know you might say that to some folks in the industry who would say, oh you know that's that's never going to happen. I mean there's a whole entrenched industry. This is the way people do things. But if you take a little edge like that and you build a narrative around why from a cost perspective and a time perspective and a creativity perspective, that could become our new norm. Then you create the appropriate sense of attention and debate. And that starts to shift people's minds. And that's what you want to do. Now, you mentioned design and the important role of design in weaving this together. Maybe elaborate on that. Yeah. Well, I, um, you know, I have always had a, uh, a real uh, fondness for, uh, for the design organization in every company. Um, I think it's one of those fascinating things that we talk about the importance of customer experience. We talk about the importance of ease of use and, and, uh, and clarity and all these other things that are ultimately uh, in the hands of designers. And yet sometimes we outsource design altogether to another company or sometimes we treat design as an internal agency that we kind of throw things over the wall to get polished up before launching. And, uh, and that's wild to me. I understand why in the early days of technology with these engineering driven cultures, uh, the, the expectations of consumers were just pretty low when it came to experience. And so design really was intended just to put a polish on things and to make things a little more clear. It's changed now. In fact, I would argue that the user's experience of the technology is as if not more important than the technology itself in determining the success of a product, which is a bit of a, a controversial thing to say because that suddenly suggests that a lot of the technology stack is being commoditized and that the interface layer, that's where the real competition is happening. That's where a lot of the competitive advantages are playing out. Um, and you're finding that even more and more as new interfaces emerge, like voice where the, 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 the power is in the default of whatever the customer looks at. Is, you know, it's almost always what you choose. And there's a lot of implications for the evolution of interfaces. Point is, 
designers have a very crucial role for the future. Would it be fair to say that building that user interface layer is even more challenging today than building the underlying product in many cases? I think it is because, first of all, it always has to be changing. I think that it, um, it also has to be catering to many different types of users. You also, we're also in the era of personalization and artificial intelligence, which has a lot of implications for the design and what a customer actually sees and interacts with. It makes the design, uh, the experience uh, design process a lot more informed by science and connected to metrics and, uh, and analytics driven. And, um, and I also think that, uh, again, as tech becomes commoditized, oftentimes what is differentiating for a brand is its design. So drawing users in through some sense of enjoyment becomes a very serious competitive advantage, even in the business to business market. It does, and it, you know, it sounds like a, um, like a soft realization, but in fact, we're playing upon human psychology. We're playing upon the tendencies of the natural tendencies of people that, um, that exist both in their personal lives and in their professional lives. I think it's an important insight. And you see a lot of companies, whether it's Stripe emerging, where they appeal to developers with very simple to understand documentation and very flashy design. Um, you, there's a lot of examples of what you would think would be very core tech-driven enterprise type sales that were in fact adopted by individuals based on a superior user experience. Scott, a number of times during this conversation, you've alluded to personalization and to AI and AR mm -hmm. and voice. Where does all that fit? Well, it's, um, this, is, you know, this is probably the most exciting part of my job is thinking about these future mediums. Everyone's going to have to take them into consideration. And if, and if those terms sounded new to any of your viewers, that's a problem. <laughs> um, and for a few reasons, let me, let me explain. So on the AI side, Every company has a lot of data on its customers that they need to use to make the customer experience better. And, uh, and customers are going to stop being forgiving of uh, presumptuous defaults that don't work for them, of, uh, of questions that they should know the answer to already. You know, the customers are going to expect a personalized experience because we're in the age of AI. So that starts with instrumenting your services and products to start collecting the right data. And then it, 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 then it means hiring a team that can understand and start to extrapolate some lessons from that data. And then it also means designing products to take it into account, which is personalization. And so it's, um, so it's, a, it's, a, real, um, it's a real vector of the future. And I think that, uh, that um, companies are going to start competing on the data that they have to enable a better customer experience for their customers. And I think that every company, especially big ones, if they don't start to leverage their understanding of their customers, they will be trampled by those that can. Um, we can talk more about that. Augmented reality. I mean, we are entering, this to me is like the next major medium. I, I actually would go on the record saying that I think someday AR will be as big if not bigger than the web. Because it will literally be everywhere. It will be a layer on everything we see. You know, we will walk down the street and we will know who we know was everywhere and what their ratings were. You know, Yelp will come alive to us, right? Directions will be transformed. There will be LinkedIn bubbles over everyone's heads. You'll have this amazing amount of knowledge and insight around about everyone in every room you enter. And then if you take those glasses off or whatever you're looking through, you'll feel somewhat dumb. You'll be like, oh my goodness, I don't know my connections to anyone around here. I don't know, there's nothing left for me here. There's no remnants from when I was here last and my old notes, like you'll want to put it back on. So that is this future world. Um, at Adobe, we think about the fact that that world will be very dry if it isn't rich with creativity and content. And so that's why we're very focused on the future of augmented reality from the creative tooling and, and, and marketing analytics perspective. Voice, let's talk about that for a moment. I think we're gonna have an expectation that we can talk to any application or device that is in our lives and ask simple questions and get very, very quick answers. I mean, look no further than anyone who has young kids. They can't necessarily navigate to a song on Spotify, on a phone or whatever, but they can ask for the song from Alexa and they can use that all day. Very, very, very powerful. A lot of design implications for voice interfaces as well. And, um, and that's why these new mediums are super exciting, ripe with challenges, but everyone has to start thinking about them. To what extent do you at Adobe, have you been tooling up for this future? Quite a bit. 
and we talk about it a lot, um, we don't think the answer is simply to make all new tools for, this, for these new mediums. In fact, we think the answer is to meet creative professionals where they are, um, using the tools that they're already using today, because um, that is what enables creatives to go to, into a new medium. And we, we've seen this many times before, before my time at, at Adobe, but from a company perspective, this playbook is not new. You had print designers who were illustrators and graphic designers and typographers. This thing came, called the web came about that originally didn't even really support graphics very well, but then it kind of became a thing. And then the question was, huh, am I going to spend the time learning this web thing or am I just going to keep print, you know, focusing on print? And some people made the migration and some people didn't. But what we try to do with our products is make it really easy to take those same patterns of how you make stuff and some of the same tools and really help people succeed in the web era. You know, and I think that that is what actually helped enable so much creativity get into web so quickly. So it's, it's a similar playbook, and I think it's not only an opportunity for us, it's a responsibility. The world's creators are using our products. How can we not help them succeed in these new mediums quickly? Scott, as we finish up, you're balancing many different uh, competing goals in your role as chief product officer. Right, Fe balancing features, balancing investment, balancing innovation against the fact that you're a public company and you need to report quarterly results. How do you, how, what are the challenges, what are the key challenges that you face in balancing these competing goals? Well, I think, um, I think there's two parts of it. You know, one which I would say is, is, I like to call it merchandising the narrative, but it's really about driving alignment in the organization. It's one thing for me to sit here and talk to you about these things that are super important, but we have thousands of people around the world that are focused every day on, on building, you know, designing, engineering, and marketing our tools. And they're focused on one specific vertical and specific problems. And a big part of my job is to make sure that all of our teams across product engineering, design, and legal, and marketing, and everywhere else are aligned with the vision of where we're going. And that we can actually have the productive arguments internally about how sure this is, and what we know, and what we don't know. That we can actually spend the time building the partnerships um, to, to help really conquer these opportunities, and to keep it top of mind, and to incentivize that progress beyond our quarter-to-quarter -quarter mindset you know, of performing and operating as a business. And so a big part of my, my job is driving that alignment. And, uh, and then the second part of mine is helping us navigate our own messy middle in all of these transformations that we're trying to do, um, which is why this, you know, this new book is so meta for me, because it's really about how do we keep our product teams you know, engaged with some of these long-term pursuits, despite the short-term rewards that we're addicted to? You know, how do we make sure that we are preserving the right time for the innovation as well as the, you know, the fixing the things that don't work and keeping the business running? And a lot of that comes down to these mechanisms of optimization and endurance. And uh, that's why it's, uh, it's fun to go to work every day. How do you drive this alignment? And I'm not asking from an HR perspective, but rather you're an author, you're a professional communicator. And so how do you drive alignment across these teams with such diversity? A big answer, a big part of the answer is design. And so I actually try to partner very early in the process of concepting some of these ideas and these futures that we're talking about with designers. And in my attitude is before I even think about the engineering implications, the business implications, the go to market, all of that stuff, partnering with designers, really battling this out of what it might look like and feel like, and then painting a picture. And I always like to say a mock-up is worth a thousand meetings. You can have a thousand meetings about what the future is, or you can just start to show versions of it, have people react to it. And the more you do, at, do that, the more you're socializing the potential future. And that's helping people prioritize the work to figure it out. And so I really partner very closely with design. And uh, I think that's a big part of it. And then that's one, one thing I'd encourage to all of your viewers, is to reconsider the role of design as not something that paints the polish and finishes something up at the end of what your product is, but at the very, very beginning helps you visualize this potential future and develop a narrative to drive that alignment around the organization to get the priorities in order. Okay, Scott Belsky, thank you so much for sharing your insights on design and for explaining the challenges of the messy middle of getting there. Thank you for having me. You have been watching CXO Talk and we've been speaking with Scott Belsky who is the Executive Vice President 
and chief product officer of Adobe, and he's just finished a new book called The Messy Middle. I want to say a heartfelt thanks to IPsoft. We are in their AI experience lab in New York City, and IPsoft is making CXO Talk possible. Now, don't forget to subscribe on YouTube, and thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day.